Welcome, welcome from the British Institute of International Comparative Law. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, you, um, you in the audience are one of the 300 people um, attending uh, this EU Europe consultation on the revised draft of the proposed Business and Human Rights Treaty. Uh, before starting our first session, uh, just a quick note about the content of the consultation and the format, how this will work for you in the, in the audience. Um, the, the negotiation towards a business human rights treaty, as many of you, uh, many of you may already know, uh, started in 2014 when the UN Human Rights Council established the Intergovernment Working Group uh, to elaborate the test of the treaty. Since there have been five sessions of negotiation at the UN, uh, a draft and then a revised draft was re released by the, by the working group. And in the latest report, after the fifth session, the working group recommended regional consultation in order to provide inputs on the re revised draft. Uh, so we're holding this regional consultation today for Europe in line with this uh, recommendation. Um, it's, um, your contribution is very important because based on the input that we received today during the consultation, we will submit the recommendation to the working group to inform the second revised draft, which is expected to be released at some point uh, in July. Uh, so we're going to have two sessions today. Um, one, the, the first start, start now and then the, the second one at 2.30, but we have five speakers covering five articles. Uh, the first session, we are going to discuss the preamble and article one to five, and the second session, article six to 12. Uh, both sessions will last 90 minutes. Um, we'll, uh, we'll end this at 2 p.m. UK time. Um, we are uh, currently based in, uh, in London. Uh, we'll then break for half an hour and resume uh, at 2.30 for the second session until uh, 4 p.m. UK time. Um, the, um, um, so your, um, um, about your contribution from the audience, um, you will have the opportunity to interact and talk uh, by either typing your comment and question in the uh, question um, Q&A box or by raising your hand and uh, telling us your point. Uh, please limit your contribution to one minute, maximum two minutes each, because uh, uh, we need to we want we need to cover many important topics today and want to hear from as many as you as possible. Uh, people in the audience are not visible, uh, but uh, our event manager will unmute you after you raise your hand. Uh, the webinar is going to be recorded, and a video will then also be uploaded on Bicol website. Uh, now I'm handing over to, to Robert, Robert, Robert McCockadell, the our wonderful chair for the first session. Uh, he does not need much introduction, but uh, uh, he's a professor of international law and human rights at the University of Nottingham, a uh, barrister at Bricker Chambers in London, and uh, uh, the director of inclusive law a business human rights uh, consultancy. Over to you, Robert. Thank you very much, Elena, and I appreciate the introduction and all you've done to organize this important and much needed consultation. Um, uh, one of the issues, I guess, that makes me particularly interested in this is that I have been involved in pretty much all the um, uh, events uh, of the meetings in Geneva so far, as, as a supposed independent expert commentating on the various drafts. So as Serena said, the first session focuses just on the first part of the treaty. So cover the preamble and articles one to five. Our format will be each of these expert speakers will have three or five minutes to raise two or to four concrete issues about the current draft of their article, including where, element, where relevant elements which they wish to keep, as well as those who wish to, cha to change. Um, we are taking the assumption that everyone is familiar with the current draft, so we won't be kind of uh, repeating it. Um, but after all the speakers have spoken, then you will have an opportunity to ask questions or make comments. And then at the end, the speakers will respond rather than having a back and forth as, as we go along to make it hopefully open enough for as many people to speak as possible. Um, and as Irina said, please keep your comments as briefly as possible. Um, and um, otherwise we've got these horrible things of having to cut you off, which is probably not great for anybody, but two minutes maximum. Um, there's a method on your screen to click on the uh, Q&A to add written comments if you want to or, or to put your hand up if you wish to speak and Liam will be able to organise that for you. 
Um, now our speakers, uh, who are a great uh, group of people who really know these areas so well, um, I'm just going to briefly introduce each of them and then uh, they will uh, um, speak on their particular area. So Jone Lepna Czernic is the Associate Professor of Human Rights and Constitutional Law at the European Faculty of Law and Faculty of Government and European Studies of the new university in Ljubljana in, in Slovenia. He's recently published two monographs, which I find extraordinary in itself, on these areas. Um, and his studies have been cited in the, the United Nations, European Parliament and Council of Europe, um, and decisions of the Slovenian Constitutional Court. He's going to speak about the preamble. Atera Van Ho is the co-director of the Essex Business and Human Rights Project, the University of Essex, and co-president of the Global Business and Human Rights Scholars Association, which I highly recommend. Her primary research focus relates to a business and human rights in armed conflict and post-conflict situations. And she's going to speak about articles one and two, which are the definitions and statement of purpose. Antoine Duval is a senior researcher at the ASA Institute in The Hague, where he coordinates doing business right project aimed at encouraging academic exchanges and raising public awareness of the intersection between transnational business and human rights. And he'll speak on Article 3 about the scope of the treaty. Mesa Zorob manages the Corporate Legal Accountability Program at the wonderful Business and Human Rights Resource Center. She's based in New York, though currently in Europe. She specializes in access to remedy for victims of corporate human rights abuse and legal liability of companies for adverse human rights impacts. She has 15 years of experience leading human rights and social justice initiatives and programs across the Middle East, North Africa and Europe, as well as the US. And she studied law in both Germany and France. And she'll speak on Article 4, the rights of victims. Dr. Daniel Guire is a senior lecturer in law at Roehampton University, where he convenes a master's in human rights practice. His research looks at human rights law and the prevention of international crimes. And he has extensive experience working for human rights NGOs, most recently for the International Commission of Jurists in Myanmar. And he'll speak on Article 5, Prevention. So with all that kind of introduction, I now pass you across to you, Nate. Good uh, afternoon. Uh, it's an honor to be taking part in this panel on the uh, draft of the UN Business Human Rights uh, Treaty. Uh, thank you, Irene, for organizing this and Robert for moderating. I will make uh, three brief points as to the preamble of the 2019 draft of the Business and Human Rights Treaty. If you look at the preamble, you will see that it is um, unusually long for a human rights treaty. And also unusually long for, uh, for example, domestic uh, constitution. It has almost two pages, and I counted 19 lines of, uh, of different uh, considerations and reaffirm reaffirmation. So the first uh, point I would like to make is uh, that uh, the drafters of the treaty should uh, seriously think about uh, clarifying the structure of the preamble, particularly emphasizing the importance that repetitions in the preamble should be, should be avoided. Because one, one can find uh, a number of repetitions uh, in, the, in the preamble. Just look, for example, on a section which refers to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and then a couple of uh, lines down, down you, you find that uh, reference that human rights are universal, interdependent, and, and so on. And, and that kind of uh, examples you can find quite, quite a few over the text, text of, uh, of preamble. Then the, also the, the, the drafter should think about the, the purpose of preamble, because usually, at least in the domestic institutions, the, the preamble has the purpose to set out objectives of the legal text and also set out the main values and principles of, uh, of a domestic constitution or international uh, human, human rights treaty. And, uh, as, and the draft as it stands now, it's quite all over the place. You know? Particularly when one compares the, the, the current preamble with, for example, preamble of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or the most recent UN Human Rights Treaty in, uh, on the, the rights of migrant workers, you would see that, for example, the last convention starts first with the reference to the international documents, and then it moves to the 
to the values and then to the principles of, uh, of uh, human rights uh, uh, protection. So the first point is to clarify the, st the structure. Second point is uh, to make very clear that the protection, human dignity, and the rights of victims is, uh, is uh, the main principle, the main value of the, of, of the treaty. One can find at the moment the reference on the, to the human dignity in one of the lines of the preamble, but it somehow were lost among all other 19 references to different, uh, to different groups, different rights, uh, different obligations of state and, and, uh, and, and companies. And in my opinion, this should be reaffirmed and make very clear that human dignity is the one that should be uh, in first, pers first place protected by the by the business uh, and human rights treaty. And my, uh, my third point uh, as to the preamble is that uh, I find it quite curious that uh, the preamble does not refer to the rule of law, to the principle uh, of rule of law, which is uh, the main pillar of any, any uh, proper domestic legal, uh, legal system which provides for uh, uh, access to remedy, which is independent, fair, uh, and, uh, and impartial. And particularly in this area of business human rights, we are, we are all aware that, uh, we are all aware that uh, many powerful players uh, often attempt to take advantage of uh, legal rules and legal principles. And therefore, the principle of real law, rule of law should be introduced in the, uh, in the, in the preamble particularly also given that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights also refers the, to the principle of law in the, in, in the, in the preamble. All in, all in law, uh, one should not under, underestimate the, the importance of preamble of business human rights treaty. Therefore, the structure should be made very, very clear. The preamble should be, should be shortened. The human dignity should be placed in the center of the uh, of the of the uh, of the preamble, and thirdly, also the the importance of uh, principle rule of law should be uh, uh, included in the in the preamble. Thank the you very much, Yone. That's yeah. very uh, helpful and a good um, summary to start us off. Uh, Tara. Thanks, Robert, and thanks, Irene, uh, Liam, and all of the Bickel staff for pulling this together. I want to start with Article One Two uh, in the definitions. Um, and I'm going to start by saying that I'm glad to see that there's an explicit reference to environmental rights there. Um, this has been at the heart of a lot of human rights abuses and it's necessary to be explicit in recognizing environmental damage as part of what is protected by the treaty. That said, I'm concerned that the definition of victim um, says that it's where appropriate and in accordance with domestic law that the treaty recognizes family members or dependents as victims. International law has guidance on when a victim is a victim. This is very clear and explicit in the Inter-American Courts jurisprudence, but it's also explicit in a lot of the UN treaty bodies. And the absence and reliance on domestic law and framing this is a problem. Domestic legal systems have often been at the heart of the abuses and to rely on domestic systems to correct themselves is, is a recipe in my opinion for disaster. I do have one unqualified compliment for the drafting committee, and that's that there is a comprehensive definition of business activity uh, in Article 13, and that is a it, it's a difficult term to define. So, so congratulations to the drafting committee on that. Um, the final comment uh, that I want to make relates to Article 2, and that's on the the statement of purpose. The statement of purpose is fine as it's written, but the treaty's design and content will not and does not meet the purpose. It cannot, as long as there's not a reference to international investment law, trade law, finance law, and development law. Uh, these instruments and treaties from other areas of international law have often been impediments to the realization of human rights. They have often shielded corporations from accountability. They have often denied victims access to adequate and effective remedies. Without addressing them head on within the treaty, the treaty is doomed to failure. I'm sorry, I, that makes me feel like a horrible human being to say it that dramatically. And yet, it is doomed to failure because the reality is, is that the international system as it is right now is broken. It privileges corporations at the expense of victims. And unless this treaty seriously tackles that issue, 
it cannot achieve the purposes that are really well defined within the treaty, within the draft. So that's all I actually have to say. I know that definitions and purposes are not the sexy bits of any treaty, but in this particular instance, I think getting these particular points correct and really tackling the issue is, is of utmost importance. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Tara. I like the fact that you actually dealt with the substance of these issues, which can often be so quickly ignored. So that's great. Thanks very much. Uh, Antoine. Yes, uh, first of all, uh, it's an honor uh, to have been invited to, to contribute to this concentration. And I want to thank Irene and the British Institute for putting it together. Um, so my perspective on, on the revised draft will be uh, informed by, by a pragmatic uh, goal, let's say. Um, enhancing the chance of adoption of a treaty uh, that in a way improves the ability of those whose human rights are negatively affected uh, to hold uh, enterprises, business enterprises accountable. And regarding Article 3 and the scope of the revised draft treaty, well, I think if you would have done a similar consultation a few years ago, uh, maybe the discussion on the scope would have been much more central. I mean, we all rem remember the the debates around the infa infamous footnote. Um, but yet, well, a month ago when Iran uh, kindly reached out to us, um, I was actually the only one <laughs> volunteering to provide some comments on Article 3. And um, I expressed also interest in Article 5 and 6, but they were much more competitive. Um, so I think I want to reflect a bit on what does it tell us? I mean, is, it, is the fuss over the scope of the treaty over? Should we just leave Article 3 as it is? And in fact, when you look at the commentators of the revised draft, you have a lot of blogs that were very positive about, about the changes of art related to Article 3 with comparison to, uh, in comparison to the zero draft. And nevertheless, and that's what I want to, to argue uh, today, I still think we can improve that version. Um, and uh, they are still amendments that can be done to diffuse even more potential criticisms, especially coming from, from the EU here, and you see my pragmatic strategic attitude. Um, and I want to, to walk you through uh, those changes that I would uh, suggest. Um, with regard to the personal scope of the treaty, um, I think we, we could still uh, focus much more that scope on the scope the wide scope of the, uh, align that scope on the wide scope of the UNGPs. And I would suggest to reward Article 3.1 as follows. This legally binding instrument shall apply to all business enterprises, including particularly, but not limited to transnational corporations. I'm, I believe we might need strategically to keep that, that second part to satisfy a number of state parties, but I do think that, that we could uh, reward still Article 3.1 and then that would enable us to, on the one side, uh, align, in, on, align the, the, the wording on the UNGPs and therefore to harness the UNGPs and the support of the UNGPs by a number of countries, while still keeping a very, very wide personal scope um, and uh, getting rid of what I find extremely confusing in Article 3, which is at the discussion under Article 3.2 around the transnational character of a business activity. And I see a lot of future problems if that were to go into the treaty in terms of interpreting those, uh, those con uh, these concepts of a transnational character of a business activity. Um, regarding the substantial scope of the treaty, so I would there also recommend that, that it be fully aligned on the UNGPs. Um, and that Article 3.2 could uh, provide simply this legally binding instrument shall cover all internationally recognized human rights. Understood at a minimum, and then I would just take the, the formulation of the UNGPs uh, as those expressed in the International Bill of Human Rights and the principles concerning fundamental rights set out in the International Labor Organization's Declaration of Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work. So this um, would certainly for some narrow a bit down uh, the scope of the relevant human rights to uh, maybe for some too limited list of instruments. But I think it would, on the one side, uh, strengthen again the draft against criticisms uh, alleging that it is a menace to legal certainty. And I think we need to take that criticism seriously. And, um, 
and attacking its lack of alignment with the UN GPs, while still leaving some room for additional standards to come into play. And there is that room already in the UN GPs. Huh? Um, and so at this stage of the process, I think uh, if one believes that a treaty is a, is a productive way forward, uh, it seems strategically essential to put the openness of the treaty in front of a stark choice, I think. Do you believe in hardening the UNGPs into a legally binding instrument or not? If not, were you really sincere when you endorsed those same UNGPs in 2011? Thanks so, very much, Antoine. That's it. Yeah. Um, and you've shown that you know, even if it wasn't your first choice, how much you have to offer on Article 3. Thank you. Um, Maisa. Thank you, Robert. And just a big thanks also to Irene and to the Bickle team uh, for giving me this opportunity to reflect on Article 4 on the rights of victims, which is uh, really dear to my heart. Um, I want to start on a positive note. Obviously, there's a lot of room of Im for improvement um, to safeguard the rights of victims. But um, just uh, before I delve into those, uh, let me just say that um, on the protection for human rights defenders, we have noted a significant improvement of the um, revised draft compared to the zero draft. So there have been uh, increased protection, as all of you know, of human rights defenders. And I think uh, it's really important to note here that it's worth fighting to keep those additional provisions uh, in the upcoming draft and any subsequent, subsequent drafts. I'm notably referring to the provisions in paragraphs three and nine, um, of Article 4, which requires states to protect human rights defenders from intimidation, uh, retaliation, and criminalization, uh, and compel states to create safe environments for human rights defenders so that they can act uh, free from threat and restriction. And this is obviously crucially important uh, given the increasing number of attacks that we're seeing around the world against human rights defenders. Just by way of example, um, the Business and Human Rights Resource Center over the past five years has tracked 2,400 such attacks, uh, and they include uh, criminalization and other forms of judicial harassment. So that's critically important. And, um, but with that said, on that, you know, positive, that positive development notwithstanding, I'd like to just touch briefly um, on three main elements that I believe require strengthening in the current draft. I'll be talking about the rights of groups, access to justice and remedy, and then the reversal of burden of proof. Obviously a non-exhaustive list. We can further discuss this in the Q&A as well. So in terms of rights of groups, um, we suggest to include uh, in a future draft an explicit stipulation of the right of victims to pursue claims collectively as a group. Um, so this is important like for class actions, for instance, to enable mass claims to be litigated in a manner that is not only cost effective, but also protects victims' claims against the effects of domestic statutes of limitations, for example, and, um, um, you know, is also fund fundamentally important um, um, for the financial viability of such claims, both for victims and their lawyers. So, you know, something like that could be added quite easily, if we look at the zero draft formulation, for instance, um, there was some wording around uh, states guaranteeing the rights of victims individually or as a group to present claims. So we suggest to just take that wording again. And then a second and final note on the rights of groups, and Tara, you've already touched upon this importantly in your introductory remarks, is to really ensure that throughout Article 4, um, family members are considered uh, as well as dependents are considered as victims. So the article one of the treaty actually includes dependents and family members in the definition of victim, but article four for some reason makes a distinction uh, between victims and their fam family members and the representatives. So if you look at article one and uh, paragraph one and two in article four, it talks about victims only, whereas paragraph four talks about dependents and family members. So that should be rectified to ensure that protection that Tara was rightly insisting on. And then just uh, quickly, I was trying to time myself, Robert. I forgot to hit press, so I'm not sure how I'm doing on time. I have two more points. Great, you've got, you've got about a, um, a minute and a half. That sounds great. All right, so I'll spend those uh, on access to justice and remedy and the burden of proof. So um, 
to ensure that victims have effective access to justice uh, and remedy, we would suggest to amend paragraph five uh, of article four um, to include um, a reference, specific reference to access to independent and impartial uh, justice as Journey has just mentioned in his opening remarks. There are essential elements of a fair trial and the rule of law and they need to be explicitly protected. Um, we are also lacking uh, an explicit recognition of the right to reparation. Remedies uh, are not, um, in, um, it is not included in the mention of remedies, uh, which might have some important implications depending on the jurisdiction we're talking about. For example, in the Philippines, the notion of reparations uh, requires a different computation than restitution and compensation, which are actually mentioned in the draft. And then finally, on that note, we, we should also be thinking about including precautionary measures. So focusing uh, also uh, on preventing harm, uh, not just addressing it after the fact. And finally, uh, we're obviously very happy to see um, an inclusion of the reversal of the burden of proof in Article 4 on the rights of victims. But we believe that this um, um, provision needs to be significantly strengthened in order to be actionable. For example, FIDH has compellingly argued that we could include a rebuttable assumption of effective control of parent companies uh, in this provision. And we should also consider deleting any reference to domestic law to ensure that states can't just use their domestic national legislation to circumvent this reversal of burden of proof, uh, which is an essential uh, element in leveling the playing field between communities on the one hand and businesses that, uh, on the other. And Tara once again has mentioned this. Now, I'm, I'm presuming I'm out of time. So you are out of time. Conclude by saying one thing that um, there are other things we should be talking about, and I hope people will comment on them, such as extraterritorial obligations, supremacy of the treaty in key areas, yeah. uh, and explicit reference to persons uh, facing heightened risk of human rights abuses, as mentioned at the preamble. <laughs> and I'll throwing in a few more issues at the end in a row. <laughs> I know, just like throw them in in case people want to ask about them. That's great. Thank Thanks very much. very much, Daniel. Thank you very much. I'm glad to see we're all broadly on the same page so far, and I'm going to continue along that line. Um, I think when we're talking about prevention, as usual, um, it's a difficult area for international lawyers, international legal scholars, and it seems that the treaty remains unbalanced in that it is most focused on liability after the violations have happened. And uh, the danger is that prevention is, as usual, overlooked. Um, also a danger that prevention becomes a corporate due diligence policy only. And I think a lot of this comes from this danger that we want states on board and in a way that the, what can result is the watering down of human rights law. And I, I think we have to be realistic. So we may not get everything we want in this treaty, but I think now is our opportunity to put forward what we do want. Think of it as a kind of travaux preparatoire exercise in that we're making a record of the debate. So I'd encourage people in the audience to, to really say, what is it that we need here? And I think really what is key is the state obligations to prevent, right? That it's dealt with in 5.1 and 5.4, but you know, we have to keep in mind the best way to prevent these violations is to protect the rule of law and human rights at the national level, to implement human rights law. And there's very little in Article 5 about this duty of states. There has to be procedural guarantees built into law and accountability mechanisms available. We also need to broadly consider if this article deals with specific issues of indigenous people local communities, and there's a very brief mention of conflict, like one word, uh, and it's obviously so important in a preventative uh, article in this, in this treaty. And finally, what about international cooperation or international coercion? Tara mentioned uh, uh, the international investment law. How is this article going to prevent states from negotiating away their ability to prevent human rights abuses through investment agreements and contracts. So if you look at 5.1 and 5.4, the state duty to prevent needs to be strengthened, right? State implementation of human rights law and the rule of law, are we allowed to have that in the treaty that states should fulfill their human rights obligations to begin with and try to overcome the state unwilling and unable problem? 
what happens in a human rights violating state that has not implemented the law? It's pretty easy for a state, a corporation to respect those laws and the national standards. Should we emphasize that national legislation needs to be in line with international human rights standards? Should we mention an independent judiciary? Uh, the, both the preamble of this document and the UNGPs have much stronger language in this area. Um, things like ensure their, nat their domestic legislation in 5.1 and 5.4, effective national procedures are in place. What does that mean? Um, procedural guarantees. EIAs are crucial here, environmental impact assessment. We have to make sure we get it right. Is that just limited to corporate due diligence or should we say the state has an obligation here as well? Um, what does it mean to adopt necessary measures? Does that mean legislate? Should we say that? Um, what's the scope? Is this is just something to do with business activities or and their contractual relationships? The UNGPs say business relationships. What's the difference? And especially this, there's a passing mention of mention of indigenous people, but it talks about consultation, but there's already a standard of consent here. Why are we going less than the international standard? And surely there needs to be more mention of uh, investment in conflict situations. Um, and I think there's something else really important here, and that's something that uh, Gabriela Chiano has mentioned in her criticism of it, of the, the absent state. We're kind of reinforcing this absent state the right, what about a state's right to regulate and to protect its public policy making ability? There's a kind of strange article here that I'm not really sure what it means, 5.5. What does it mean about setting and implementing their public policies that states shall protect these policies from commercial interests? Should we be a little more specific here? Should we mention the international investment regime? Should we mention trade policies? Should we mention, uh, contracts with foreign investors. Uh, I think that when I, I open up to the audience suggestions here. How can we better protect the state's ability to protect rights at the national level in its, in its uh, interactions with investors, but also multilateral institutions? Again, the UNGPs go into a lot more detail about this, particularly in regards to international investment law, but also into regards of working with multilateral institutions that may not have human rights as their number one priority, that are often emphasizing investment and economic growth at the expense of human rights. So I think really there's a, a lot of scope here for changes or additions to, to strengthen the prevention aspect of this so that we won't need as much liability exercises in the future, right? Uh, hopefully that would be the, the overall goal here. Okay, I'll, I'll leave it at that because I think we can, I can go into more detail in response to questions from the, from the audience and panel. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you all uh, speakers. You've added very good, uh, insightful comments and interesting. There's quite a range of links between your comments and what you've said, which is also very helpful and powerful. So I'm really now in the hands of the participants. This is a consultation. We very, very much want your thoughts. Um, and so uh, please put your hand up and indicate that you want to speak. Um, we'll start with those who have the hands up first. Um, just a couple of reminders, um, no more than two minutes because otherwise that's unfair. If there's something you want to then respond to a comment from someone else, we might have time at the end. Um, but please put your hand up and then we, after the hands, we'll then try to um, uh, move to uh, those who put down questions in the Q&A. Um, I'm in Liam's hands as to who's first. I understand Shane Darcy, you're first. Take it over. Thank you, uh, Robert. And thank you to all the panelists for really great presentations over giving us an overview of the opening preamble and articles. I agree with the comment from Jernage that the preamble is quite excessively lengthy. Um, in relation to Tara's discussion of Article 1 and Article 2, also following three and four as well, there seems to be a structural issue that we're starting off almost like a piece of UK legislation, which definitions, and I wonder should we maybe reorient that and talk about this, the, the purpose of the treaty, maybe move Article 2 up, or maybe even consider a, a restatement of the, the state duty as Danny was referring to. 
Um, but specifically in relation to definitions, Article 1 2 talks about uh, and borrows the language from existing guiding principles on what a human rights violation uh, is. Um, but it seems to omit the important part from the UN basic principles and guidelines. So it describes the various types of harm that may arise. But in the basic principles and, guiding, and guidelines, they say arising as a result of a gross violation of human rights or humanitarian law. Now, we don't want to go down the route of gross violations, but I think that there needs to be an insertion of these types of harm, including environmental rights, as um, Tara mentioned, but arising as a result as a violation of those particular rights, because it seems to be omitting that, omitting that there. So that was just my comment on those provisions. It's really helpful, Shane, and you also did the great thing of being clear which article you're speaking about, because that would help all the panellists going forward. Thanks very much. Uh, Dahlia. Okay, you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, sorry. Hi. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, so I, I have a, a couple of comments concerning uh, effective remedies for victims. Um, I also had the chance to read some of the comments of different states, especially developing countries, to the draft. And I believe that one of the concerns is that essentially developing country would be left could be left to deal by themselves with multinational enterprises in the sense it will be the fault of the developing country where the subsidiary is incorporated that violates, potentially abuses human rights to deal with the problem. And I think it's very important in this sense to ensure that extraterritoriality and judicial cooperation are there because I see this as the only valuable option for victims to obtain justice, to ensure that they, if they don't, if they are not able to reach justice in the whole states, they're at least able to reach justice in the home states, and there should be some form of cooperation here. Um, and in this sense, I also have a question concerning the um, committee, because I think that um, it's clear that the committee can have some kind of assessment on the countries, but when you have a transnational enterprises, how do you assess the country and which country would you assess? Also, I'm wondering if uh, it would be useful to have either collective of individual complaints mechanism at the committee so that, for instance, if a company is abusing human rights in multiple countries, multiple people from multiple countries could assess and could, could, could reach this committee um, and could write a complaint. And, and that would be not the problem of just one country like the whole states, because otherwise this could end up being become a problem, let's say, for developing countries and having developed countries saying, okay, we're washing our hands over this, because in any case, we have done enough. We have already effective remedies in place against our parent companies. So I would emphasize this. Great, many thanks, uh, Dalia, and perfectly on time. Uh, Marcus. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Um, Marcus Kajewski here. I have a question which relates both to comments by Tara and by Daniel regarding um, the, I guess, the relationship of this instrument and human rights in general with investment law and, and, and trade law. Now, I completely agree, and I will speak about this maybe in, in the second consultation, but I was wondering what your view on this is, whether we should sort of have just one article in which all of these issues are dealt with, or should it be scattered out throughout the the agreement. I think Daniel said maybe in Article five, um, 5, and Tara also mentioned that it should be referenced to in the, um, sorry, in the Statement of Purpose, and I was just wondering whether maybe they should all be, all these issues should be just in, in one article. So that's just the one the question. Thank you. Great, many thanks, uh, Marcus. Um, there's a question on the Q&A, or a couple of questions from Alison Berthet. Um, Alison, if you could um, uh, please uh, speak, uh, that would be helpful. Uh, Liam, are you able to bring on uh, Alison? Hello. Thanks, um, Alison. <laughs> apologies, I kind of wrote them as they came up <laughs> throughout the panelists' comments. If you could ask both of them, I think. Yeah. 
article? Um, I, so the first one was on, on article three, um, really just agreeing with Antoine's point about aligning the scope better with the UNGPs um, and the confusion that a paragraph two brings about. Um, I have a more general comment about what the value of the, you know, in particular transnational corporations adds um, and, 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 you know, um, actually that it would be useful to make that more like, well, clearer in the operational parts of the treaty um, where it is intended that there should be you know, a particular focus mandated, because at the moment it just feels like this thing that hanger on from earlier discussions, but with no actual translation into um, specificity in the, in the later clauses. Um, and then I guess on Article 5, um, I think, again, the convergence with the human rights due diligence in the UNGP's you know, concept is, is very welcome. I, I wonder whether an explicit incorporation would be clear and provide more certainty, um, cognizant of the fact, you know, many companies are, are using that as, as yeah, what they use for understanding what due diligence means. So I'm um, curious to know if that's deliberate. I, I can't help but notice the, the narrow reference to contractual relationships rather than business relationships. So I wonder if, if that was, you know, a, a deliberate kind of copy and paste with a slight tweak to the UNGP definition of due diligence. But I leave it at that. Thanks very much, Alison. Uh, Nadia. Hi, sorry. Um, yes, uh, I had a, it's not really a question, but it's more a point I wanted to make in reaction to what Antoine said about the list of applicable rights. Um, it's, it is tempting, I think, to keep the list of the UNGPs because, you know, as I think it's been mentioned several times, there's a consensus on it, perhaps. But I, I want to add here that there's really omissions um in this list and you know we can list all human rights treaty to an to, to an extent and I, but i don't think that would be a good idea but i would be in favor of at least including CEDAW, so the convention uh on the elimination of discrimination against women which i think is really a glaring omission especially in light of the gender framework uh of the uh, un working group on business and human rights from last year uh, and also, what is also missing, and it's been mentioned already today, uh, is the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which I think are not given sufficient attention um, in, the, in the draft. Uh, that's it. Thanks, Nadia. There's also a question, of course, about customary international human rights law. Um, uh, Karine, you're next. You're on, Corinne. Ah, great, thank you. I have a general comment that I would like to make and then a, a specific comment. The general comment um, follows a bit um, on Shane Darcy's um, comment as well as the comments made on the preamble and by Daniel on um, the, um, which article did he comment on the, uh, uh, prevention um, article. And this is that there are some provisions within this draft treaty that are extremely detailed um, concerning the rights of victims, prevention, legal liability. And some of the suggestions that are being made are to make those more detailed. But I wonder in line with the comments made about the preamble in terms of trying to focus on key purposes and objectives, whether the, there shouldn't be some thought given to restructuring the treaty in a manner that also addresses the key concepts of the UN guiding principles and um, the basic concepts that need to establish the framework with then leaving details on, for example, prevention rights of victims and legal liability for separate um, documents that would then supplement um, because the concern is if the provisions of this treaty are too detailed, then the um, specifics are fixed. Um, there will be, they could be construed as limits on states um, obligations, um, providing sort of a, just a minimal standard. And as developments occur, um, the provisions could become outdated. And this is a very rapidly evolving area. Um, that that's my general comment. My specific comment um, is with respect to 
the failure to mention um, national or ethnic, religious and linguistic minorities in this document. Um, they're not mentioned in the preamble or in um, Article 5.3b and 14.4, um, where other groups are mentioned. And I, um, I think that specific oversight, um, given the reference to them in the UNGPs and the prominence of them um, in international, key international um, human rights instruments. Thank you. Thank you, Corinne. Um, next speaker is Josette, and then after this is Sander. Josette. Um, hi, I'm Josette Hermans from Safety Children. Um, I just had a small Q&A uh, set uh, because I was wondering about the special court for victims, perhaps, perhaps as an idea next to the multilateral investment court that we will also will plan to have in Europe or maybe as part of the multilateral investment court. That's all. Thank you. I'll leave that one to Maisa to answer. Uh, Sander, your call. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Sander Heonusa from uh, Women Equals Men Dutch Gender Platform. And I had a few uh, remarks about uh, gender in the preamble and in Article 5.3, I think it was. Uh, in the preamble, um, there is no mention of uh, of gender equality. There is mention of equal rights of men and women, um, but gender is well a lot broader than that. Um, and in one of the latest, um, there is also noting the role that the guiding principles on business and human rights uh, have played um, in the preamble. Um, and I think it would be a good idea to also mention uh, the gender dimensions uh, report by the UN Working Group. Um, and regarding Article 5.3 or Article 5, I think it would also be a good idea to uh, mention uh, uh, gender impact assessments. Uh, since at first human rights impacts of corporate activities uh, aren't gender neutral. And I'd like to leave it at that. Thank you very much. I think it's very helpful. The issue of gender dimensions is, is relevant across the whole of the draft. Uh, there's an excellent blog by uh, Penelope Simons on this, which I think uh, raises these issues as well. Uh, next speaker is uh, Mona. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, it's all yours. Great, great, thanks so much for, for putting this together and great to see familiar faces, Tara and Maisa. Um, so my, my comment was more specifically to Daniel. Um, speaking about prevention, I think one of the, the articles that um, ESCRNet members have been pushing really hard for is Article 5.5 um, on corporate capture essentially. So. My question is more about how we can um, limit this phenomenon of corporate capture, whether within the text of the treaty or um, in, you know, multilateral platforms such as the treaty platform, where um, you know corporate lobbies are, you know, more likely to 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 come in and have their influence in order to limit the strength of the the text and so on. Um, so, yeah, would appreciate more uh, input on that. Thanks a lot. And thanks very much, uh, Mona. Uh, Nicholas Alakon. Sure, thanks. Uh, I think someone else um, already sort of made this question, but in terms of international investment law, um, do you see do you see any 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 way of putting um, something in the treaty that can avoid conflict with international investment agreements, and um, maybe most important with um, already existing international investment agreement already signed and, and ratified by the states? Is there anything in the treaty that can help or, or can sort of bind um, arbitral tribunals? to take into account a human rights obligation for, of states. I don't know if it's explicit incorporation of the right to regulate that has been used a lot by states as a defense in investment disputes could be helpful or sort of this, this subordination of international investment law. I don't know if it's tenable under international law. Thanks. 
Thank you. I'll leave that one for Tara to pick up. But also it's interesting in the original zero draft, there was a specific mention about how it would be balanced and that of course has disappeared. So you raise a good point. Um, Athena Stafilia. Uh, Athena. Hello. 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 Did you hear me? Hello. Yeah, if you could speak now, it'd be great. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, so to Nicolas first, uh, this is my position too, that uh, the inclusion of international investment law in Article 2 and Article, para five, uh, Article 5, Para 5, as uh, Ms. Van Ho and Mr. Aguirre suggested, already suggested, I believe that uh, this addition to the international investment law, and as you said, uh, this was uh, in the first draft, this would be very, very helpful to clear the problem uh, of, uh, that Nicolas already mentioned, the problem of hierarchy between conflicting international law rules and declare a subordination of investment law to the international law of human rights as expressed uh, in the draft. Um, to that comes additionally my first comment that uh, an international court for victims a special international court for victims as a last resort would be here a meaningful addition uh, as a last resort remedy in case that national jurisdictions refuse to do justice because they are confused uh, about um, arbitral um, awards on investment treaties, about conflicts between international rules. Um, I believe that an international court uh, would be a very good and meaningful last resort because we have already uh, the international court in the hug but this is a solution uh, only with a compromis uh, between the states and uh, the victims do not have any remedy so i believe that an international court for victims uh, as a last resort um, remedy would be here very meaningful thank you very much uh, thank you very much. Of course, once again, in an early stage, there was an optional protocol drafted that hasn't been um, uh, diminished or dismissed, but we don't know where that is. Thank you very much for that question. I'm conscious I've only got a couple more people on the list of people who have either written or put their hand up for questions, and we do have some more time. So I would encourage people either to put their hand up or to uh, write written questions, or even if you just want to put a note in the um, question answer box that you want to ask a question, that would help um, us enormously. Okay, the next um, person who has a question is uh, Ilyeda. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is Ilyeda uh, from Koch University in Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, Robert, this question is actually uh, for you. It's a general question about the flow of the consultation. I was wondering in the schedule, I could only see um, the schedule that goes until Article uh, 12. And I was wondering if we will be able to uh, discuss uh, further articles. Thank you, that's a great question. Um, I'll leave uh, Irina to answer that uh, for you, but uh, thank you for raising that. Um, uh, you can answer that at the end, Irina. Um, okay, um, I have a Claire from, uh, a question, sorry, from Claire Methven O'Brien, Claire. Yes, hi, Robert. Hi, uh, good to have you on. Yes, oh, thanks. Um, there's a bit of background noise here. I hope it's gonna, um, I'm gonna be audible. But I just wanted generally to open discussion um, of views that I have previously uh, expressed um, uh, on various occasions in, in different outlets of, about the viability of the whole approach of the current text. Um, my opinion is that the current text doesn't and probably cannot work as a human rights treaty um, for a variety of, of legal reasons. Um, and actually what could work both legally uh, and diplomatically would be a treaty based on much more closely 
on the uh, obligations and responsibilities described by the UN guiding principles. So what I have proposed is um, a treaty which would look more like a framework convention, which would describe general uh, obligations of states uh, and of companies of a scope that largely tracks to what's already been defined and subscribed to um, by states in the guiding principles. So yes, that's the, the sort of general um, gist of my um, question is whether actually, you know, plausibly something which in any way resembles what's currently on the table is ever going to be adopted or could be adopted by sufficient numbers of states or should we actually be trying to um, uh, establish a different approach uh, in the sort of time and the scope that's left to the current process. Thanks very much, Claire. And as you note in your question, you've just published today a draft text for what it would be, which is brilliant. Um, I, I have seen you uh, write on this. I think it's a very powerful argument. And Penelope Simons also wrote something in the book by um, uh, Surya Deva and David Bilchitz about the need to look at this in the same way as the um, uh, climate uh, change uh, framework treaty. So that's a very, very helpful uh, issue and I'll probably leave that maybe to um, UNA and Terra to kind of pick those that kind of question up but it's a really very helpful uh, point. Um, currently I have no more questions listed um, and we have I was going to give about another five or ten minutes before I went back to the uh, experts but what I will do um, uh, is to go back to the expert speakers now I don't know quite what um, uh, and then they can answer what we've we've got and then we'll come back if we have any more questions at the end. Um, I think that's probably the um, uh, best way forward. I've got, now, I noticed now a couple more questions have come up, but I'm going to, uh, okay, I'm told different things. Let's go forward with a couple of questions to come up, sorry speakers, and then we'll uh, go back to you. Um, uh, Eduardo, you have a question uh, to add to a um, uh, question which uh, Marcus uh, uh, asked before. Um, thank you very much. It was not that much uh, a question, but you know, to provide an element of, of an answer, um, of course submitted to, to Mises answer to the question, but um, I believe that this is not, um, this is not a matter of a conflict of laws. So it should remain, I'm sorry, I'm talking about the burden of the proof question <laughs> that was raised before. Um, the burden of the proof, in my humble opinion, should remain in Article 4 and not moved to Article 9 because it's not a conflict of laws uh, point as such, it's more of a procedural uh, point. So I just wanted to contribute with my opinion on, on that. Thank you very much. No, it's a very helpful addition. Thank you, Eduardo. And uh, Jill from FOEE. Hello, can you hear me? You're a bit quiet, but so maybe speak up, please. Okay, I'll try to speak loudly. Apologies, I don't have my proper headset. Uh, my question was on, I think the issue has been raised of uh, how specific and into what level of detail the treaty can go. And um, I work at EU level where there is planned EU level legislation on human rights due diligence. And I'm wondering about possible issues that could arise if there's a very specific EU level legislation as well as highly specific instructions within the treaty, what would, what would happen? Thanks, Jill. I'll let uh, Daniel ask that tricky one. Um, I'm also juggling with exactly that kind of issue, so it'd be helpful to know what uh, Daniel thinks. Um, okay, now um, I'm going to go back to our speakers and give you, you, you know, probably um, five minutes each to respond. Um, and um, I'll go in the order that we uh, first spoke. So, Yone, it's uh, you to begin. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, let me let me address a question or comment made by Corinne first, and then I'll briefly tackle a comment and question uh, just uh, made by by Claire. Uh, Corinne, I, I agree with you uh, with your comments. I mean, basically the the preamble as it stands is very is very confusing. You know, the issues mix uh, between each other; they all over the place. One line talks about the right, a particular right. 
another about uh, vulnerable group, another yet another about uh, state of state of state obligations. So my suggestion, my suggestion would be really to clarify also in the line with the, with the content of the treaty, you know, in, in the line with the, the content of the articles, shorten the preamble and make very clear from the beginning what are the purposes of the treaty and then uh, move to the principles. And of course, mentioning the values, uh, which I mentioned, human dignity and the principle of uh, uh, rule of law. Uh, as for uh, Claire's, uh, Claire's comment, uh, I mean, you, you're right. I mean, the current, the current state of affairs is as it is, particularly within the European Union. Union member states are not very uh, enthusiastic about the, 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 the current draft, at least the majority, majority of them. But then we all still have to ask ourselves what, what is the the essence, the purpose of the treaty is the essence of the treaty to help in the first place states to implement the national action plans uh, and receive from the from the national implementation of national action plans that is very deficient. I can talk more more in detail about the region I come from Central and Eastern uh, Europe, where only four states plus Georgia. Uh, adopted national action plans and those four or five national action plans are very general vague. they not they do not provide any additional access to remedy for victims of uh, business uh, business related human rights violations so i'm not sure that your proposal what you suggest would uh, bring any added value you know, uh, in comparison to the to the to the current uh, to the current draft, I would nonetheless say that uh, in this area where we daily witness so many human rights abuses and violations, so many uh, trumping on human dignity of individuals, uh, uh, and even more now uh, within the COVID uh, pandemic, there is a need for a, a binding uh, international instrument, which would then uh, give incentive for states to adopt uh, more uh, more uh, long range domestic measures in order to provide to provide uh, for more effective access to remedies for for victims but at the end of course uh, the access to remedy and the right of victims to bring uh, uh, alleged uh, perpetrators uh, to justice depends on the quality of the rule of law system in the particular state you know any any international treaty will not help in this regard, and it much more depends uh, on how how those those values of human dignity, rule of law, uh, equality will be internalized by people who you know perform the the roles of judges, uh, prosecutors, uh, lawyers in the in the domestic uh, sphere, and of course human human rights uh, uh, defenders. And uh, just to conclude, Robert. Uh, I would uh, I would add that at this stage we are now uh, in the fifth round of uh, consultation. Uh, many drafts of the treaty uh, already. Uh, I don't think that there is a time to to step uh, to back down to step back. We have to insist on the implementation and adoption of the of the of the treaty and uh, uh, following also the uh, the adoption of the enforcement uh, mechanism under the uh, under the treaty i don't think the the proposal you claire make it will bring any any added value to the to the justice and uh, human dignity of individuals who suffer human rights violations thank you yune for your insightful responses uh tara thanks robert um i'm gonna start by picking up where you already left off and that's to answer claire's question on the framework issue um the, the, the proposals for framework conventions have been around since the first proposal for the treaty and the states just haven't picked it up. So it's, I mean, if we were going to start over at, at point zero, maybe that would be a great approach, but I'm just not, I feel like we're stuck with the treaty that we have right now and the priority needs to be on fixing, fixing the deficiencies of which there are many. Um, starting with the structural issue then that, that Shane raised, 
I do think that those two articles should be flipped. I think that the structure generally within the treaty right now is slightly disorganized and slightly, um, it sort of feels like it was a hodgepodge, like everyone brought their favorite article to the treaty and they sort of tried to arrange it with appetizers in the beginning and, and mains in the middle and desserts at the end, but that doesn't necessarily create a coherent framework. Um, that said, again, not the most pressing of the issues within the treaty because there are so many other problems with it. Um, so that takes me to the definitions by Shane, the questions on definitions with Shane and Marcus. Um, so the question that Shane asked was, should it, should it have a, a, a statement of as a result of? Uh, first, I wanna make sure that we should not go down the framework, down the way, down the path of using gross violations or serious violations. Like we need to do away in many ways with that language within, within human rights, generally speaking. Um, but specifically within the area of business and human rights, where we've already recognized that businesses have a responsibility for all human rights, and let's stick to that. But when it comes to the as a result of, that relates a lot to the question that Marcus asked in the Q&A. And I started to answer that, Marcus, but my, my answer is like three paragraphs long, and then there were lots of other questions being flown at us, so I, I stopped writing that. Um, my answer to that, though, is that... Uh, the, the treaty links abuse and violation as one as one term. Um, that's a narrower term than what impact is within the guiding principles or what impact can be understood to be within the guiding principles. And here I want to highlight a piece by David Birchall that really, that really addresses that and the potential of the use of the guiding principles phrasing to broaden the types of responsibilities that businesses have um, and where they can be held account to. Um, I also think that because they're linking these two, talking about as a consequence of a violation or as a consequence of a breach, it becomes a, it, it becomes a narrowing um, thing. It becomes a narrowing language. We don't really still now know what the definitions for cause, contribute, and directly linked to are within the guiding principles. I, I just finished an article, so hopefully some of you will see it soon, uh, trying to unpack what those terms mean or rather what they should mean because the current definitions are actually broken and part of the problem. Um, I feel like a, a, a serious, pessimist today. I swear there are days where I'm optimistic about business and human rights and where we're going. This, these are just issues that we haven't struggled with. We don't actually know when it is we want businesses to provide, to provide remedies. If we're being honest with ourselves, we don't know. And that's because of the complexity of the kinds of cases that come out of these issues. Sometimes the state is the primary perpetrator and the business assists. Sometimes the business is the primary perpetrator and the state assists. Sometimes neither of them is the primary perpetrator, but they create the conditions by which harms arise. And the, that myriad of, of times in which we want businesses to take a more active role and which we want the state to, to regulate the business's impact um, means that I think everyone has shied away from being really prescriptive in this area. Um, so I think this effort to sort of link them and kind of obscure when exactly do they have remedies is really an effort to try to capture a broader range than what a strict legal definition would provide. Uh, within the treaty, the intertwined nature of the abuses and how they're addressed uh, means that there's no real significant benefit to separating them out and defining them individually. And I actually really like the approach currently uh, because it leaves open the potential for the recognition of direct substantive human rights obligations on businesses. And the treaty itself doesn't do that. But here, Irene and Nadia have a, have a recent article out on UNCLOS, and there they talk about how UNCLOS recognizes direct obligations and what the treaty could do with that. Um, so I like, I like the current language, and, and I like sort of the vagueness and obscurity of it, if I'm being honest. Uh, and then this raises the final thing, which is the investment law, where I think obscurity would be a problem. Um, I, to be clear to, I, I forget who asked it, if it was Shane or, or Marcus, um, I don't think that it needs to be in the purpose. I don't think we should be addressing investment law in the purpose, but rather the purpose of the treaty can't be realized if we don't address investment law somewhere within the treaty. So I would like to see a standalone article. I would also like to see a standalone article on business and human rights in conflict situations. Uh, dispersing it throughout the treaty, I think has a potential to undermine uh, the value of the treaty and it has a potential to really obscure some of the more technical issues that arise from these, from trying to link investment law and, and business and human rights. Um, when it comes to subordination issue, 
Remedying deficiencies from one set of treaties via a different set of treaties that don't necessarily have the same actors involved is almost never going to work. Uh, I would like to see a very strong investment law clause. I would like to say to see a clause that asserts that human rights, pri human rights responsibilities have to take priority over, over competing investment law claims. I would be happy for that clause to be in this treaty. That said, I am I have no faith whatsoever in the ISDS processes that they would abide by that or find themselves subordinated to this treaty. The best we can hope for within this treaty is that we have clear language that forces the arbitration tribunals to take into consideration human rights under the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, Article 31. Um, so if we can sort of make that much clearer to the arbitral tribunals that the states understand that these two areas are linked, then we have a stronger case of making that argument. Um, but in terms of finding language that's going to subordinate investment law claims to human rights via this treaty, I don't see that working under the current framework of public international law. Um, the final thing is, and this relates to some of the questions about the victims' courts, the reality is, is ISDS in and of itself is the greatest threat to human rights that we have when it comes to business and human rights. Um, and until we burn the system down, and I, I'm not supposed to say that phrase, um, I've been prohibited by my colleagues at Essex Business and Human Rights Project from saying that we need to burn the system down, but I'm just throwing caution to the wind. I already said that this was going to be doomed to, to failure. So I'm um, throwing caution to the wind and saying, we need to burn the investment law system down if we want to provide real adequate protections for, for human rights and real accountability for businesses. Okay, I'm going to halt you there before we burn the whole house down. Um, but I'm impressed we managed to bring in investment law, law of the sea, and everything else into human uh, business and human rights. So thank you so much, uh, Tara. Um, uh, and now I'll, I'll move to Antoine. Yes, I have a little problem. You hear me? Yes. Um, no, my daughter is running around and making noises. So if you hear things, listen. It's you're brilliant to be um, able to this online anyway. So if you, we are not so, worried. So um, I think I had two direct questions: uh, one from Alison and one from Nadia on Article Two. The one uh, of Alison was focused on uh, on the value of uh, adding the I, the concept of transnational cooperation. And I think um, in, my, in my eyes, there is very little value in having it in uh, Article 3.1 if uh, we replace it by all business enterprises. However, I do think as well that it might be strategically necessary uh, and perceived as an important concept by a number of uh, states that are behind the treaty um, that it might have to be included, but I don't see it as necessarily a, a, a big problem to have it in there. It doesn't do much if we have all business enterprises as the main, um, let's say, concept defining the personal scope. And then turning to Nadia, Nadia had a, uh, a question with regard to the uh, human rights that are covered by Article 2. And, um, and she recognized that it is tempting to use the list of the UNGPs, but she would like to see as well um, instruments like CEDO and, and the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And I'm evidently sympathetic to, to this view, but I'm also, and here I think uh, it's about finding the trade-offs between having a treaty. Uh, so here we have to be in a way strategic. Uh, I think that at this stage, to fight off um, the criticisms that will come and will be intense on legal certainty and so on, it is important that we narrow down the scope to the scope that has already been endorsed by consensus in the UNGPs. But the scope of the UNGP is also a bit vague. And I think there are the seeds to have those instruments indirectly in included because it says understood at a minimum uh, and that is already uh, a, a, a word construction that we can play with to make sure that uh, instruments like CEDO and the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People become over time once we have it uh, a real part of uh, the human rights that are covered by the treaty. And here I would like to uh, move to a more general comment that is connected to the intervention of Claire 
and uh, to the discussion that, that already Yane and Dara have started. And it's a lot about uh, strategically, what do we want or what do uh, we academics, but also uh, activists, uh, uh, if, if the aim is to have a treaty, um, we need to uh, think in a way um, that enables a consensus to build around that text. And um, I think that will imply that we will need to work with the current draft because a new draft coming out of nowhere will never be acceptable to those that have worked so hard during the last five years around that draft. So we need to work around that current draft. But I do think that we need to make sure that that draft aligns as much as possible with the language of the UNGPs, because that will be, in my eyes, uh, the most likely scenario in which we have a chance to bring over uh, a number of countries that are decisive in making sure that this treaty is successful, especially the EU countries. Um, and in that regard, I think this in, even aligns, and that's why I was a bit surprised to see that uh, Ruggie, in a way, was first very resistant about the treaty process. That is the whole idea that is behind the constructivist approach of Ruggie and the idea of the UNGPs. Um, that they would shift a little bit the landscape and that that shift would enable to move towards binding. And I think it's, it's crucial that we, binding human rights due diligence obligations are a big change. And if we can need, link those binding human rights due diligence obligations with the possibility to go to court over them, this would be a massive change compared to the current landscape. So I, I think if our work is to make sure that the text finds, is fine-tuned in a way that we can bring together a sufficient group of, of states that might have very divergent interests to support it and to make sure that it happens and that it turns into a, a, a binding treaty not so far away in the future. Thank you. Thanks very much, Antoine. I like that uh, approach and, and the passion you bring. Uh, Misa. Thank you, Robert. Um, so on access to remedy in home states, I think several uh, of the participants have brought this up and that is such an important um, consideration. I mean, uh, Dali, I think you were one of the first ones to raise this, but it also goes to the points uh, made by the Believe Josette and Athena. Um, so I think, uh, you know, Tara's already commented a little bit on courts, etc. cetera. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm for one glad that you, you use the language of burning down, but that's neither here nor there. I think, you know, whether or not, um, you know, we should consider uh, sp special courts after local remedies have been exhausted or not. I think what's really important is that, you know, we, we really insist on effective uh, access to justice uh, for victims. And the first step for me is to focus on extraterritorial obligations of states and strengthening them and making sure that they're included in this treaty uh, or have an explicit reference to them. Um, now, well, this, I know this is a difficult subject, but um, when, like one of the things I keep thinking about, like for instance, if we look at um, the last year's report of the corporate human rights benchmarks, um, they've reviewed almost 150 allegations, I believe, um, of severe allegations of human rights abuses. And they uh, affirmed that only in 3% of the cases, companies have provided remedies that were actually satisfactory to victims. And this to me goes to the heart of the problem. I mean, we can't obviously rely on companies to provide effective uh, remedy. And we really need to insist on state obligations uh, to provide it, uh, uh, both at home, um, both in home states, um, uh, and in host states. Um, and Daya, that goes to your point of, you know, uh, certain countries um, uh, just not having the means or the, the judicial systems to ensure effective just, uh, access to justice and remedy for victims. And Jernay, you've made a similar point on the importance of, you know, the rule of law and the quality of judicial systems and, you know, um, that impacting significantly to what extent victims can actually have effective access to justice and remedy. Um, 
And also just to say um, that uh, I think this uh, insistence on extraterritorial obligations has also been part of the discussion in Europe um, uh, around the uh, new legislation on mandatory human rights due diligence. Um, on the reversal of the burden of proof, and thank you, Eduardo, uh, for kind of answering that question. I actually agree with that, um, as Eduardo is, like there was a question around, should the reversal of burden of proof be moved to Article 9 on applicable law, or should it stay in Article 4 on the rights of victims? I agree with Eduardo. I believe it should stay in, the art in Article 4 on the rights of victims, not just because it's not a conflict of law, but perhaps more importantly, because it's an essential element in ensuring that victims actually have effective access to justice and remedy. You know, I've touched upon this uh, briefly earlier, but, you know, we all know just how difficult it is, uh, or if not impossible, for communities and legal proceedings to actually produce the kind of evidence, or even have access to the kind of evidence that will be required in order uh, to demonstrate th certain things, such as duty of care or others. Um, and, you know, we need to do anything that we can in order to alleviate this burden of proof um, and uh, to really kind of correct that power imbalance we were talking about earlier um, um, and this profound inequality of power and wealth between communities on the one hand and the corporations uh, that commit these abuses on the other. And one way of doing so is to really recognize uh, this reversal of burden of proof as an essential right of victims. And that's why it should live in Article 4 on the rights of victims. Um, and the final point I'll make, that wasn't really a question that was addressed to me. Um, so I, I, but I, I think it goes, it still touches upon Article 4 rights of victims. So I'd like to just um, quickly include that. And others have already eloquently commented on, you know, uh, uh, CEDA, whether or not we should make reference to CEDA and uh, conventions on the rights of indigenous people. Um, whether or not that should be included, I think one way to at least at a very minimum include these important demands for recognition of, uh, you know, um, of, of um, persons who are at heightened risks of human rights abuses, yet women, indigenous people, but also children and refugees and migrants and persons uh, with disabilities or persons living under occupation in conflict zones is to um, include reference to this group of people in Article 4 that deals with the rights of victims. Um, as I briefly mentioned earlier, for now the only reference to these persons at heightened risk of human rights abuses is made in the preamble and it doesn't uh, seem to uh, re-emerge anywhere else. So I suggest to at least include reference here, kind of repeat it, reaffirm it in Article 4. And Thanks I'll so much, uh, Maisa. That's great uh, responses. Uh, Daniel. Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to come in a little bit on this question of uh, what happens if the EU has its due diligence standards and the treaty has a specific standard. And I think this, because I think it really hits the cent like the, the heart of the business and human rights issue, which is that every country and region regulates differently and businesses have always realized that there are advantages to this for them. Um, and we have to really decide, like right now, the whole treaty, I mean, there is no danger of that in the treaty now because it's all written in the, the prevention article, at least it's written in this very passive language, deferring to national standards and necessary measures and these kind of undefined things that won't terrify states out of the room, right? So if, if I was in the EU, for example, I would be worried about the other way around. I would want a much higher standard in this treaty because I would know that my businesses are going to be in a competition with, with businesses from other countries that don't have the same due diligence standards. I would want a very high standard in this treaty and I'd be promoting this treaty. But I've said this many times to various people in the EU and I never seem to really, never really seem to catch on for whatever reason. But the, uh, the point being here, do we have to decide, are we saying states must regulate in line with human rights law and implement the rule of law at the national level and then they're free to regulate in line with human rights, uh, in line with this treaty or are we saying this treaty sets the minimum standard? And it's, it's kind of unclear to me what, what we're doing here. Um, and I think, you know, that that's, takes us back to 20 years ago, the same question. What happened, are we in a race to the bottom? Are we in a, every state regulating how they want, or are we saying there are standards? 
aren't those standards human rights law in the first place? And what happens when states don't implement their human rights law obligations? And I, and I think that's part of what I would like to get out of this is that the state duty to prevent needs to be stronger in 5.1 and 5.4. What does it mean that they shall ensure their domestic legislation requires all persons conducting business activities? Can we say they shall ensure that their domestic legislation is in line with international human rights law? and requires all persons conducting business activities. Can we say in 5.4 that states parties shall ensure effective national procedures are in play? What is that? What is an effective national procedure? The UNGPs go into more detail on these things. If you look at uh, the UNGPs, they, they talk about uh, appropriate steps to prevent, investigate, punish, and redress such abuse through effective policies, legislation, regulations, adjudic adjudication. The commentary talks about taking appropriate steps to prevent, investigate, punish. You know, it's a much more detail. I never thought I'd be defending the UN guiding principles here, but here I am, right? Because here, it, this is stronger language about law. Um, so, and I, I think we there there needs to be a focus on on this issue and and i hope that we when we write this up we'll be able to make some specific recommendations of, of adding a few words i'm really worried in the prevention section I, I like tara's idea of a separate article even or at least something in prevention on conflict it's just sort of a added little word mention in, in the middle of in the middle of article five and in, I have a whole bunch, and also indigenous people. It, it, it says consultation rather than consent. The final thing is I have a whole bunch of questions on investment law, and I think Tara already answered it, mostly it, it, all the main issues there. But I, I would again point to the, amazingly, to the UN guiding principles. It, it has language there. And in, in, the, in the operational principles five, it said states should exercise adequate oversight in order to meet their international obligations when they contract with, legislate, et cetera. Uh, operational principle number nine, states should maintain adequate domestic policy space to meet their human rights obligations when pursuing business related objectives with other states, business enterprises, or through investment treaties. It actually mentions the investment treaties. And then finally in 10, it talks about how they should interact with multinational, multilateral institutions that insist on other priorities. This language could, could maybe strengthen that rather unusual 5.5 article that is kind of vaguely mentioning this stuff, but without anything concrete. And I know why we're vaguely mentioning it is because everybody's terrified that nobody will sign this if we make uh, strict or, or, or strong commitments in it. And I, and I think that's, you know, that's for the, the final negotiations and the diplomats, at least here, as I think mostly human rights advocates, human rights lawyers, and especially in our audience, we should be advocating for the strongest language possible. Um, because nobody's going to do that after us, right? I mean, after this, it gets handed over to states and then states say, no, 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 no. But at least we have a record saying what we wanted before it gets watered down further. And, and I, I hope that we are able to, to convey this in our, in our recommendations to the working group. Well, thank you, Daniel. It's a perfect way to draw this session to a close um, on exactly two o'clock. Uh, so uh, thank you so much. You've brought, all of you have brought such insightful, thoughtful, and clear ideas to this process. Hopefully this consultation will enable um, uh, some clarity to go forward in the next draft. Um, and I also want to thank the participants. I mean, we've had a huge number of participants who many of them are absolute experts in this field as well. I mean, that's a wonderful thing, seeing our colleagues out there who are also working on this in so many different uh, locations from those um, on the ground to those working for law firms, to those working for international organizations, and of course, uh, for those as academics and practitioners. So thank you so much. You're a wonderful, wonderful group of speakers. I really appreciate that. And then finally, I'm gonna pass you across to uh, Irania. Thank you again for Bicol for organizing all this. And thank you. Uh, thank you, Robert. And from, from Bicol, um, many thanks to also to our brilliant speaker, Jerni Tara, 
Antoine, uh, Maisa and uh, uh, Daniel. Of course, many thanks to you for uh, participating, for your comments and questions. We will incorporate them in the recommendation. Uh, the next session will be starting half an hour, so we'll break for uh, 30 minutes for, uh, for a coffee and uh, whatever, and uh, um, we'll focus on Article 6 to 12. So there was a question about covering the following articles, so 13 to, to 22, so basically Section 3. Um, so we have decided to focus our speaker presentation on the more substantive articles and leave this uh, um, the, the, the more implementational and procedural um, articles, uh, which are on ratification, reservation, uh, entry of force, uh, um, amendments, and, and so on, um, we, we uh, leave out from, from the presentation. But of course, uh, uh, even if speakers are not going to present on them, we are taking any comments and inputs uh, from the audience also on those articles. Um, so the webinar, uh, um, it's been recorded, the, 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 the link will be on Vicor website. We also will, will uh, send all the audience a follow-up email. Normally we do that the next day, but we may take a few more days this time because we want to collect all the materials that have been mentioned. So uh, by in the, in the next few days, you will receive it. Um, uh, so we are going to break for, for half an hour. The next, um, the next uh, session, um, very important, please, you need to uh, log in using um, a different Zoom link which you have received where you have signed up. So this, this uh, webinar is, will finish now and this link will not be, uh, will not be uh, available anymore. <laughs> okay, thank you again and uh, we'll see you in, uh, in half an hour. Thank you everyone.